So Piti, I went on my own, got this scholarship. So all right, I think we are live now. Yeah, we are live. Alright. Okay. Uh, I've also. So, uh, Udita, you can go ahead and. Yes, please go ahead and do that. Yeah. Okay, we'll just start in a minute. I think we're just waiting for all the participants who are in the waiting room to join. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. We'll just start in a minute or so as soon as it's three o'clock. Uh, thank you for uh, being in the waiting room in the meantime. And we are very excited to have uh, Dr. Kajal with us for today's webinar and we will get started uh, in just a minute from now. In the meantime, uh, Odita and Babita, can you guys just share our uh, initial slide please? Yes, Anand. Thanks, and just go to full screen, please. All right, I think it's three o'clock. We'll get started. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, welcome on behalf of Sangat and uh, Essence. We are delighted to continue our series um, of Essence Policymaker Engagement uh, Talks. Today we're going to have Dr. Kajal um, from uh, the UP CADR, who's an IAS officer, speaking to us on evidence policy making in mental health. I'll introduce you to her in a short while. Just very quickly on uh, Sangat and the project. If you could go to the next slide, Babita, please. SANGAT is an organization uh, which has been around now for almost 25 years. We are entering into our 25th year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are focused on uh, working uh, in multiple spaces. Mental health is one of the areas we work on. Uh, also, early child development, addictions. Um, and you know we are very committed to improving health across the lifespan by empowering existing community resources to provide appropriate uh, physical, psychological, and social therapies. Um, as I said, uh, while we are headquartered in Goa, we also have offices in Pune, Bhopal, Delhi, uh, uh, with, in many states. Uh, specifically, Essence through, uh, is uh, the project through which we are holding today's webinar. It's a five-year project which is funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Mental Health uh, with the name to bridge this uh, gap between science and uh, mental health care services. And uh, the, poly, uh, the project uh, basically seeks to generate evidence on cost-effective implementation approaches for scaling up evidence systems uh, for mental disorders, in particular uh, depression. There are two elements uh, of uh, the project. One is a scale-up element, one is a capacity building component. If you could go to the next slide, Babita, please. So uh, the scale-up component essentially is a research-based component, which is being implemented in Bhopal and Sehor. ASHA workers and trying to uh, see if digital training for ASHA workers for providing psychosocial therapy for depression is something which is uh, possible to do. Um, it is a specific program known as the Healthy Activity Program, which is a brief psychosocial therapy for depression. And then we have uh, the capacity building component, which is uh, a component through which we are capacity for research professionals, for policy makers, program managers, and search findings. And we have multiple activities under that umbrella as well, many of which you can find on our uh, website and our uh, project web, web page as well. So as part of the capacity building component, we are also doing these series of uh, engagements with policy makers, uh, speaking to them around mental health advocacy and you know what do we need to do to highlight mental health in the policy discourse in India. And uh, we are delighted today that Dr. Kajal has agreed to join us. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, uh, Babita. But in uh, advance of uh, introducing uh, Ka Dr. Kajal, I also wanted to talk about some ground rules which we will follow. One is that I request all of you who are uh, participants to kindly keep yourself on mute um, and also keep your video off. Uh, you are welcome to ask any questions you might have for Dr. Kajal in the chat window. And if you are following it on this event on Facebook, then through the Facebook comments uh, option. 
the moderator who is me and my uh, colleagues in uh, essence will collate the questions and we will ask the speaker on behalf of all of the participants once she's finished uh, giving her introductory remarks uh, we are going to keep this as a safe space so any rude or uh, inappropriate questions which uh, are asked by anyone on the chat window will lead to that participant being removed from the webinar uh, again remember that speakers in this series are speaking in their individual capacity and their views might not represent that of their employer uh, the government so while they are public officials uh, this is also a place for them to be able to share their own perspectives uh, based on their experience and and in their personal capacity so i'll i'll stop there in terms of just uh, the background uh, very quick i will introduce uh, dr kajal uh, dr kajal is a uh, doctor by training uh, ias officer of the 2008 cadre she is based in uh, uttar pradesh um, she has trained as an obstetrician and gynecologist from uh, pgi chandigarh she also received training in global health sciences from uh, ucsf california she has offered administrative and managerial oversight with technical and strategic uh, inputs in rm and cha in public sector driven programs and also been involved in multiple uh, project implementation exercises she has extensive experience of working with uh, multiple stakeholders including ngos international aid organizations etc dr kajal is skilled in operations policy design policy uh, program management negotiation strategic planning as well as monitoring and evaluation and has uh, extensive experience also on focusing on interpersonal skills she is very passionate for healthcare and has multi country experience especially in low and middle income countries uh, for interventions for quality care uh, for quality healthcare for all um so it's my pleasure in on behalf of uh, sangat and essence to uh, to thank uh, dr kajal for joining us and uh, dr kajal will be speaking on evidence based uh, policy making in mental health welcome dr kajal and over to you uh, for your introductory remarks uh, i believe we'll be presenting some slides and then we'll have discussion thank you so much for joining us thank you dr anand and uh, good afternoon everyone i am i it's my pleasure to be here today and talking on this very important uh, sector like this issue is very very critical especially during the given days of this covid-19 pandemic i mean i appreciate that uh, I, i would say that i'm not a mental health expert per se as you all now are aware that i come from uh, obs and gynae background and i have uh, uh, learned public uh, public health skills but at the same time mental health is something that i feel is a very very neglected area and we where uh, these pandemics like covid-19 there, there's a large you know uh, kind of uh, threat that is looming upon us in the coming days and i think it's a, it's already has been started if we uh, might look into the data so um uh, thank you everyone for having me here and joining uh, with us and i would be happy to take your questions and as uh, dr bhan has already said um i'm trying to uh, give you the perspective uh, from the policy side as to how these things get uh, they happen and you know they come into they are put into place and i have made a small presentation and it's a uh, kind of a mix between academic and uh, you know implementation side uh, just to give you an overview if you have you are coming from this background i'm sure you know most of these things it's kind of a refreshing a refresher course for you again but uh, those who are not very much aware perhaps it will give you an oversight about uh, what is happening in this sector uh, across the world in our country particularly and what are the challenges that i perceive are there and how we can you know maybe find some solutions together discuss about it and uh, there is always a scope uh, and i believe that you know working together we can always achieve this goal um so thank you dr bhan once again for having me so uh, i have a small presentation which i would like to share so um starting on that i will give you a bit of perspective that uh, this whole thing you know uh, although this area has always been very close to me um, uh, my own uh, grandmother has suffered uh, you know this mental illness after i lost my dad 
uh, when we were pretty young. So I have seen how much it affects the family, how much toll does it take, and uh, particularly in the recent times uh, when COVID happened, and we all have seen the plight of migrant people, people losing their jobs everywhere on LinkedIn, on social medias. You go and you see so many posts every day where people are talking about they are being furloughed or you know being laid off recently. Uh, the stress factor is very very high, and I would say this COVID pandemic has totally you know uh, change the way the, we were uh, we were used to uh, we, uh, we were carrying out our daily activities so basically uh, it has like kind of reverberated through our like lives in a very very different way and given this social isolation lack of financial security i believe there is a there is a lot of stress in everybody's life these days so given this kind of stress along with you know you you can have your work life balance you know all those things they can pile up and recently another episode that moved me was the death of one of my employees um, she like i'm like this i can say that it's not a clear thing that she committed suicide i would say so very young girl very bright girl with a phd you know uh, i would i could see a bright future for her and all of a sudden we get this news um, of her suicide which was really uh, you know very much uh, a sad uh, sad event for all of us so after that uh, you know uh, we tried like to give you know little things that we can share with our employees how we can make our life you know a little better amongst these uh, depressing times i would say so before we get into that, uh, I, I would like to share with, with you this uh, evidence in policy making. I have tried to keep it more general, but a special focus I've tried to uh, give uh, on the mental health issues. So if we go, um, if we see the progress over the years, I would say there has a lot been happened over the years so far in the past uh, few decades. If you see that this first Caracas Declaration of Mental Health and Human Rights, it, it emphasized the need for developing psychiatric uh, care in close links with primary care through community-based services. And also it advocated for a legal framework. And then in 1995, we had this World Mental Health Report, which spoke about the burden of this mental health disorders in uh, low middle income countries. Uh, this is a very good uh, source, uh, which is which came in 2001, the WHO Mental Health Atlas. And I would recommend all of you to go through these reports. The last one, which has been updated is in 2017-18. Uh, and I've used some slides from there uh, to see what is happening. It, it gives you a comparison. Uh, first time it compared the data on the basic indicators of mental health illnesses and uh, we can see what is happening across the region across the world and then in 2007 uh, lancet as we all know that it's a high impact good journal publication and it came with a series and it told us about the treatment gaps that are existing in the low middle income countries and how do we scale up the services so then 2007, the movement for global mental health happened, which is a call to action where all it, it's a kind of virtual alliance where all uh, you know service providers and everybody came together for this cause. Then we have the mental health gap initiative by WHO. The grand challenges in mental health gave a new perspective to the research area in 2011. In 2013, we have the WHO's mental health action plan that how we can carry it forward. And a very, very big milestone that I believe on which I would like to speak a little more is in 2015, that is the sustainable development goals. That what we really need to achieve by 2030. And as you must be aware about the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which were, uh, you know, were to be achieved by 2000, uh, this uh, we were, you know, we lagged behind and now this uh, new targets have been set for all the countries and India has also given commitment to that. And particularly, I believe these SDGs, all the SDGs, uh, whether they would be, uh, you know, communicating with any department, but mental health is kind of involved in every SDG that we will go through it uh, in, the, in the next few slides. And then latest is the 2020 Lancet Commission on the Global Mental Health, which concurrently addresses the prevention and the treatment gaps. And a lot of my slides I have taken from there as well. So uh, what is going on in the world? So if you see this uh, chart, I would like to tell you, like it's very much apparent by seeing that chart, we all know that we are in this uh, Southeast Asian region uh, where you can see how much expenditure we are making per capita, which is given in US dollar by WHO region. So you can see that, you know, the Africa and the Southeast Asian region, we are really low on the ex expenditure that we are doing per capita. And for India particularly, we are spending like, 
less than 1% of the total budget of our health. So this is something, you know, that's a basic thing that we should know that, you know, the financing is the framework, like you, you know how much we are spending and how much we can achieve then. Coming to the next one, and this you can see the dark color is showing you the dark green that the percentage of countries where persons pay nothing, they are fully insured. And you can see this European region, 100% is like insured or at least 20% towards their cost of mental health services being paid. But in Southeast Asian region, as we all know, 40% is coming from out of pocket. And in India, it's like very, you know, uh, it's hard to know, it's a sad thing to know that uh, 70 to 80 percent of our you know uh, health expenditure is coming from oops that is that is what we call it as out of pocket expenditure and this is is a very common side that you will come to come across people where i've seen they have sold their land they have sold off everything because there is so much uh, debt on them and you know these ex treatments are so expensive and uh, this leads to uh, the terminology that we use in public health as catastrophic health expenditures and uh, this uh, this gap really needs to be improved upon and then the infrastructure of course you know you you have to have the service providers and if we see into the workforce how many how much health workforce we have for mental health per 100000 population again you can see of african region and the southeast asian region is like 2.5 and i'll give you the data on what in india we have Particularly, I remember in uh, the state where I have worked, uh, we had very few psychiatrists, like perhaps maybe seven or 10 few years back. I'm not sure about the latest data, but uh, psychiatrists are particularly, you know, I would say we still have a good number of other specialities um, in the country, but uh, psychiatrists, we are really, really short of these people. And if you further break it down and see, you know, who are the people who are providing the care, so you can see by the color that the green color is showing you the number of psychiatrists, which is 0 0.4 per 100,000 population for Southeast Asian region. And you can see that the majority of the uh, these kind of services are provided by the nurses across the uh, all the regions of WHO. So the Lancet Commission has identified across the globe, what are the five leading grand challenges for all of us. So if you see that they have tried to identify what we have done so far and where we should be focusing in the coming times. So number one is it's very important that we need to integrate these mental health services into routine primary health care. And uh, I will also talk, uh, you know, uh, what India has done in these regards and where are we. So um, overall, I mean, uh, these are very, very important things because, uh, you know, as I already showed you, we don't have the psychiatrists, we don't have the specialized treatments available in that sense. So where we can depend upon, and this is something very important in public health that we really have to prevent and not let it happen, you know, unless if you can stop that, that is the whole premise of public health. So this is very important that how we can integrate this core package of mental health into the primary health care. And then, of course, you, you once you reach there, then you reduce the cost and improve the supply of these drugs, which are uh, you know used for these disorders. And then the very important aspect is training the health professionals, particularly in these in low income and middle income countries like ours. And we have to have evidence based care for children, particularly who are vulnerable groups. And then adequate community based care and rehabilitation for people with chronic mental illnesses and strengthening this mental health component in the training of all healthcare professionals to create an equitable distribution of the health providers. So uh, this is something they have identified as the you know grand grand challenges and this is like across all the countries um, India is no different. And now particularly what I, what I was talking about is the SDGs. So this is very important that now we have particularly, you know, focus on this uh, mental health illnesses through SDGs. And you can see I've highlighted and, you know, it's in bold letters that which indicators are talking about uh, this mental health issues. So SDG three is overall generally related to the health and, um, you know, giving healthy lives and well-being for all. But if you see the indicator 3.4.2, it's particularly talking about the suicide mortality rate. You talk about 3.5, it's talking about substance abuse and 3.8, which is the ach achieving universal health coverage that I just gave you the example.
Dr. Kajal, I think we might have uh, lost you. I hope, I think you know, maybe you're, there's a connection issue. Um, so for everyone else, kindly just wait while Dr. Kajal reconnects. Can you hear me? You lost me, I think. Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, please continue. Did you lose me? Do I need to go back? Yes, you were um, on, I think your slide just after the SDG. You were talking to the SDG slide. Okay. So, all right. I'm sorry. My network is a little patchy today. So, Maybe yeah. Um, so, I was talking about this SDG thing. It's very, very important one. This is the right one? Yeah, I think this is Is this the right one, Dr. Ban? No, the one before this, I think. All right. Uh, before this. So are you talking about this one? Is yes, this that's one? fine. You can, you can go ahead with this. Yes, this is where you were. Yes, that's where we lost. Okay, so I'm sorry for this internet problem, but yeah. So five uh, leading grand challenges that have been identified India is no different about having and facing the similar things where we need to focus upon. And it's very apparent and evident from the data that we do not have the, those number of psychiatrists available and the specialized, specialist treatments and all. So how do we prevent? So we have to integrate these services at the primary care level, you know, integrate it into the primary care services. We talk about universal health coverage, and I think it's a very, very important thing to integrate this core package into it. And then, of course, you know, once you have the problem, then you have to reduce the cost and improve the supply of the drugs that are required to be treated for these mental illnesses. Another important aspect is that you have a workforce which is trained uh, and it provides evidence-based care and especially for the vulnerable groups and they have identified children and also the community-based care and rehabilitation for people with chronic mental illnesses and strengthening this mental health component in the training of all healthcare professionals to create an equitable distribution of providers. It's very important to understand that, you know, uh, this mental health is not just a product of any sign and symptoms that happen in your body physically. It's more about the product of your social, cultural, and, you know, your, the environment and where you are. So the whole system, you know, that leads to this mental health problem. So it's very complicated, very much complex. Uh, so that's the problem that we have to understand how it, how to deal with that. You just can't go and treat the thing and that and then you feel that it's over. No, it's not that. It's beyond that. And that's why I would say that it's important slide to understand that how SDGs are related to these mental health. And it's for the first time that we have laid down the specific goals, like, uh, for example, you know, about this indicator is 3.4.2, which is about suicide mortality rate. And we have talked about this promoting mental health and well being for the first time. And also, 3.5 target, which is about substance abuse. And lastly, but not the least, the 3.8 about achieving universal health coverage, which is, as I spoke earlier about this catastrophic health expenditure, people having a lot of debt, private sector giving most of the, you know, service providers are there. So are most, more of the, most of the services are provided by the private sector. Uh, so if, if that's a scenario, so it's very important how our population, especially the needy and the, uh, the vulnerable ones, they should have access to these uh, services. So um, that's why I've given this slide, which is very, very important because I, I feel that, you know, you can have different indicators. You can see on the left side, all these SDGs, but if you can see how they are all somehow, you know, connecting with this mental health. And it's, it's an overall product of your whole social environment, your culture, your, you know, political environment and everything, it's, it's, it's being communicated. So if you look into the quality education, so, you know, it's when you talk about policies, it's very important to understand that not just having one policy, particularly under the health, it's going to solve your problems because it's, it's an intersection of so many things that are happening around. So what you see as a mental illness is not just a product of just one thing. So that's why this slide is important to understand that, you know, 
how we can actually uh, improve upon the mental health of our uh, people when we have to have policies in not just one area, but we, we need to have focus on all of these. So you look into this quality education, so you, you know your community, social capital, social stability, culture that comes from the education, the values and norms that we have. And we all understand how much stigma is associated, how much discrimination is there. There was a latest survey I was reading about somewhere and people just don't want to employ these people who have mental illness. So almost 70% of the employers were not in favor of that. So that is something uh, I'm just giving one example that how it affects you. So uh, if we talk about this peace, justice and strong institutions, which is number 16. So you have seen in the refugee camps, the countries where we have a lot of violence going on, even with the you know childhood abuse, sexual violence, everything is related to your mental health. So every SDG, if you go into the details, I'm not going to take your time onto it, but my takeaway from this slide is that if you want to improve the mental health, you just don't have to take it as a standalone thing. You have to have all these determinants to be taken into consideration and then formulate a policy which should be encompassing everything. So this is a very big takeaway for all of us. And then Coming to our India, what's happening here? So these are just the numbers which will tell you like the how how you know big this burden of mental health problem is to us. And it's given in this scientific terms, but just to make you understand that it's huge. And we have really short of people like psychiatrists and psychologists. And this latest survey, which was done in 2015-16, uh, I would say that it has shown that 13.7% lifetime prevalence of national uh, this mental illness is there, and over 150 million Indians need active intervention. So this is really important to uh, you know uh, go through these and uh, in India particularly uh, if you see these states this is from the latest Lancet publication of psychiatry 2020 and I've just got these four slides for you just to you can have a look like across different states and you can see all these red marks which are bright red so these are not and these are you know high with depression and anxiety and if you look into this idiopathic developmental intellectual disability conduct disorders. So this is a survey that has come to us that, you know, and Lancet has said that, you know, almost uh, one in every seven per persons in India are having this uh, problem. So it's, it's, it's a huge number. And I guess that's where something we really need to uh, see. And over 1990 to 2017, from where this data has been collected, the proportion, proportional contribution of mental disorder to the total disease burden has doubled. So that is something which is worth worrying about. So let's see what we are doing for policy in India. And I would say that, yes, we have done a lot. And if you compare other countries, India has done uh, a quite good in this, in this area, particularly that, you know, we had the national mental health program since 1982. And uh, we started this program because we understood there is a, there's a need, there's a lot of burden. And we re, uh, you know, strategized it in approximately 2003, where we started focusing upon our uh, this uh, mental health uh, institutes and trying to give them, uh, you know, modernization of our state mental hospitals, upgradation of this uh, these psychiatric wings in the medical colleges. Then we came up with this recent mental health policy in 2014, uh, which is, I would say, is a very, very welcome step. And this uh, late, very, the most recent is the Mental Health Care Act of 2017. And I've gone through this act and particularly, you know, it's very, very heartening to see that the mental health is now being recognized as a social right, as a, as a fundamental right. And they have provided provisions, um, uh, the government has provided provisions for this, uh, you know the, the, that your right has to be you know ensured and there are provisions for penalties they have created central authorities state authorities i mean the institution has been created and in the next 10 years we have now the implementation has to be done and i believe this is a very first step towards you know improving mental health in india and the one thing that i was talking about was how to integrate our you know mental health services package into the primary care so one very good thing that i found was that including these services into this concept of health and wellness centers which has come up recently in the past few years government of india is working on it and we all are working on it is to 
uh, you know, put this concept into it and provide guidelines and the guidelines of these health and wellness centers, uh, you know, ensure that these mental health services are also provided uh, at the community level and integrate it into the primary care services. So I really uh, think that, you know, over the years and in particularly last one decade, you can see there's a lot that has happened over it. So that shows that we have that kind of, you know, awareness and that kind of awareness is being generated and we are getting there. So it's, it's, a, it's a good beginning. So now we have recently, along with my uh, two public health, uh, you know, friends, professionals, uh, we prepared a paper on that because when this COVID pandemic happened, uh, we thought we should be writing about this so that people get more aware. And if I could in any ways, you know, if my voice can reach out and, you know, uh, bring, uh, bring all the stakeholders together, uh, that how we can improvise because not only one person be responsible for everything it's it's a teamwork so that collaboration needed to be done so we have tried to uh, you know put down how we can actually make it happen in a country like ours where we have lack of infrastructure we do not have uh, that much workforce required so how we can go about it so the very important thing that we always talk about everybody talks about is that we should have a policy and the high quality data from research should be there and we see the gap so how, how we can bring a policy which can be informed by this data and it should be evidence-based. It should be, you know, contextualized to your local conditions and not just be, you know, borrowing from some uh, Western country or something like that. You need to understand what is going on in your community. And then particularly if we talk about policies, then migrants, daily wage workers, healthcare workers, women and kids, with disabilities, people are there, minorities. I mean, there are, uh, these are the vulnerable groups which should get the priority after any policy and mental health policy is uh, no different from that. So then you have to have a preparation of a collaborative and coordinated approach. And as I said, in a, in a country like ours, where, you know, most of the uh, service provider uh, that provision is with the private sector, we need to involve all the stakeholders such as government, which should be having the stewardship, the private sector, the community level civil society organizations, and then only we can create this transformative structural change. And the, the grassroots level organizations, I believe they are very, very important because particularly we have seen in our country, like country like ours, where, uh, you know, uh, in, in these kind of diseases or illnesses, uh, it's the family which provide, which is the which is the first line of you know service provision, and they are the service, they are the care providers, and they should be taken into you know they should be they can be trained as well, and they should be taken in their their needs and what how do we need to analyze how we can make empower them to actually utilize their uh, services to improve the mental health um, uh, illness of the family member. And along with the communities, I believe that this is very important that we need to engage with the communities, the kind of stigma, the kind of discrimination we just saw during even during COVID-19 pandemic, you all have been watching these kind of news getting around that the healthcare workers were not allowed, you know, or the people were not very much responsible in some places. So there is a kind of, I guess, there's a gap between communication and how do we engage the community? What are their doubts and suspicions and myths about it? I mean, how we can remove it? And the lessons have to come from the context and not just, uh, you know, cannot be just imposed from one side. So we proposed that there should be a cross-sectoral convergence platform where we have this uh, interdisciplinary research, which is, you know, feeding into it. And then we disseminate the credible information, misinformation should be removed, the fear stigma should be removed. And the most important part is that whatever we do has to be sustainable. It should be resilient, it should be sustainable, it should be done over the years in the next few years to come. So where do we lack? So what happens? You know, this is a very good triangle that I, I can say that if you are from public health, you might be knowing about it, but those who are not, it, this is how things happen, that you there are people who are doing research, the people, those who are doing policy, and then there it has to be practiced. So what is this red arrow is telling you? This is the most important thing. And whenever you need to have a policy, you, you, you need to set the agenda, like, and how this is, you know, set that is the most difficult thing because there's a lot of research going on on one side you have the policy makers on the other side and there's no communication so how do you bridge the gap so 
uh, I read a, uh, an article from, I don't remember the country, but it is a very, very, I found to be that paper to be very innovative in um, global health action. And uh, it was from a very, uh, I think African country. And what they have done is that they have created this national uh, health agenda. So on the on similar lines, uh, you know, we, we feel that there's something like needs to be prioritized. We don't have the resources to do everything. There needs to be done so much. So what we can do, we really need to, you know, have the stakeholders in place, need to understand how many resources we have and then prioritize what needs to be done and what would be the timeline. Systemically, you map your resources, your funding and everything. You prioritize your research in that area, periodically map the outputs, and then foster the dialogue between the researchers and the policy makers. And then how we do it, this is more like an academic thing, but you know, it's very important to understand that you have to align can be community organizations, it could be the uh, government, it could be private sector. So you need to create that kind of policy influence plan. Be, you become the knowledge broker if you are very much interested and then identify the people, the champions who have really done good work because if the information is coming from them, it's it's very credible. And you know, policy maker will definitely tend to hear them more. So these are some of the tools that have been provided like how we can actually influence the policy. But I'm really happy to see that you know, already we have, you know, enacted an act in India, we are on that line. And I believe it's really uh, important, particularly during these days where we are uh, during this pandemic, which has created so much, it has hit us so hard. So um, I was doing a research and uh, it uh, showed me that, you know, uh, the domestic violence has risen over the time. And there is like, there's, it's, it's like, it has shown a stark cleft in the kind of, you know, um, the care that we have, the kind of uh, uh, the gaps that we have. So I think it's very important timing and we are learning and uh, this is an important time where we can, uh, we, where we should be working on this particularly important issue. So the goal of this year, we all know October 10th is celebrated as, as the World Mental Health Day. And uh, I would like to reiterate that we really need to increase investment in mental health because that's the basic premise at the foundation. We increase the investment, increase the services, integrate them involve the community, I would say, and then, you know, um, have a coordinated approach and have this interdisciplinary approach that your policy is informed, it's coming from the evidence. And I guess that's the way forward. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kajal, for that presentation and giving us a great insight from a policy perspective also on the evidence and how that evidence can be linked into uh, policy making. So I think what we'll do is for the next, uh, uh, you know, the remaining time that we have around 25 minutes, we'll focus on some questions and already quite a few questions have come in as people have registered. You know, one, uh, so you highlighted the paper that you wrote in the Economic Times, which talked about a convergence approach, but I also wanted to talk to you, um, you know, from the perspective of a research organization like Sangat. So you highlighted also that research is an important component for policymakers to be able to take decisions, uh, you know, in, in the light of evidence. So, for mental health specifically, you know, what would be your advice for uh, research organizations, for researchers? Where, where would you like to see more research happening, which can help inform policy? So, maybe if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I think uh, you know, uh, as I already said, you know, the priorities always, you know, it it always depends. Like the you see, like for example, maternal deaths, you see the ch child deaths, and these things are. Of course, you know, it's heartbreaking and the uh, mental illness, you don't see that kind of thing, right? So it's more like, you know, you, you have a more uh, visibility on those kind of things and your, your resources as a policymaker, of course, you know, uh, so far over the time, as we all understand, we have been into this thing. Uh, we have been putting our, you know, funding and resources more into the reproductive maternal child health. And now in the recent times, I've seen, you know, the perspective has changed and we have moved towards non-communicable diseases mental health so um i would say that from the research organization as i already said that very important thing as a policy maker which i have observed even as a policy maker myself you know if if it's a it's a person who's a champion who has credibility 
uh, they bring a proposal and they broker that knowledge and they try to you know give you the concepts and the factual data around that that why something is important and why it needs to be taken priority over other things uh, we do this and like we we understand them and i believe that's very important for the research organizations to understand that uh, whatever research you are doing number one it has to be very very credible it has to you know there you need to have those influencers in place which can really influence the policy making in uh, you know in the system so um, i would say and there is a window of opportunity always like for example this covid pandemic i would suggest i would say this is a very a big opportunity window of opportunity for mental health public health professionals to you know um, advocate advocate for this cause because this is something with the lack of like financial security the loss of livelihoods the stress people have gone through uh i i think not this we are very much sensitized uh, i would say like you know as a policy maker that we understand that this is something very important so you really need to uh, yes, take this whole thing into you know consideration and then advocate for the cause thank you for that um, so you know one of the other questions which has come through and uh, when we had registrations was you know there are a lot of people who are getting trained also um, and maybe you know in the uh, as specialists so psychologists psychiatrists counselors but sometimes the problem is that there are no jobs available for them especially in the public sector so you know you also highlighted the fact that we do have issues with not enough specialists being available to serve uh, you know our, our mental health needs now one realizes that not everything requires uh, a specialist you should be able to handle a lot of this in primary health care as you were rightly pointing out but for some conditions you will need a referral mechanism to a specialist so what is it which can be done uh, in the policy circle to try to make sure that we have adequate uh, posting of uh, psychologists psychiatrists etc in our in our health settings especially for a referral uh, channel yeah it's very important see the first thing is as we all understand is if we can prevent nothing is better than that right so the community level the primary care level if we we can train the people and put them in the you know in the frontline workers if we can engage them we can train them i uh, we can prevent a lot of you know things uh, from happening and getting worsened so the only you know this whole thing can be curbed at that level so the major so i would say the major resource should be you know focused on that area and we should be developing those curriculums in that sense that people are trained at the village level at the community level and understand these are the kind of signs and symptoms which are happening and people have a place to talk and then uh, you know and it should be like given the kind of uh, system like the stigma and the discrimination and all it has to be confidential private how we how people can you know be very much confident they should be confident that whatever they are sharing will not be revealed and uh, nobody else would be privy to the information uh, that they have shared so uh, it's very important to have those kind of you know uh, enforcement of the laws and uh, and and i think that mental health care act has already you know stated all these things that uh, nobody's information can be shared or be accessed by anybody else and uh, their rights to privacy and everything will be maintained so we really need to enforce it on now and then the second step would be i think to devise this whole mechanism i would see and one of my you know psychologist uh, she is a good friend we were talking in last few weeks i think few weeks back and she was telling me about that there is a there is a gap like the psychologist and the counselors right both there are not many i think there's no provision of counselors in in india like something like that so i'm not very sure about this whole thing but i think there is a space for people like them where whom we can roll rope in and you know they can also provide their counseling and majority of the things can be tackled at that level one example i would just give you from my whole experience in us as a student like if you you are studying in any college or university in india i just uh, never felt that i had that kind of hand holding if i am having the stress of the exams or i am having troubles you know i have some personal issues and and you know my studies are getting affected i had no platform to talk to anybody here but you know in us it's a system like you know you have this thing in your insurance and you know you have to have that insurance in place and you have the counselor available and then they refer you to the if you need be like to the next level but you know it's all about like i wouldn't say that you know 
uh, we can spend that much or we have that much, many resources but at the same time you know creating some sort of infrastructure and as i said the social determinants of mental health if we can have the curriculum in our education like how we can you know talk about mental health how we can make it more open how we can you know discuss these things and remove stigma and fear from the people so all these values and norms will come from the educational thing educational side we have to you know attack that we have to amend that we have to improvise that similarly you know i i would say this all these social determinants if we can start working on them the need will go down and then you know and also at the same time we start training the other side expanding our workforce and then it's it has to be like a, col a collaboration of all these efforts you just can't have one thing and you know you feel that this is to be done that's how i see it it's more like more like a bigger vision to tackle mental health Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges in mental health in India is that, you know, we have some sort of a crisis around mental health in young people, you know, adolescents, young adults, our uh, death by suicide rates are also among the highest in the world in that age group. So, uh, you know, there are some questions in the chat window around what do we need to do, uh, maybe from a policy uh, implementation perspective around promoting adolescent mental health and also the mental health uh, needs for those who are in Say you know uh, in custody uh, under uh, you know because they are juveniles so they are in custody right now because of um, any you know, uh, uh, they might have committed a crime but obviously they are not yet adults so they have been taken into custody but we have not yet looked at issues around their mental health so what can we do in that space? Again, uh, I would say that this is again linked up to, you know, most of these people, if you go through their background, you know, they must have suffered some, you know, some, some kind of abuse or violence in their families, their childhood has been disturbed. So uh, that's what I'm saying. The mental health is not uh, just a physical sign and symptom that you see. It's a product of all that that person has gone through over the years. So somewhere they are not, uh, you know, able to comprehend that what are the, what is right and wrong for them. So it's more about, you know, starting having that kind of, you know, positive parenting, that kind of ecosystem needs to be created. So how they are, you know, they are the children, they are given that kind of confidence and security. And then if they have reached to that level of juvenile custody and they have committed some crime, even after that, I mean, I'm sure that if we have those kind of institutional structures in place, it, it, it will definitely reduce a lot of these, uh, you know, things. But, you know, the people, those who actually land up in these areas, finally, we need to have then, you know, this kind of mechanism of institutionalizing counseling, institutionalizing and providing them with, you know, free access to the drugs in these particularly, you know, these kind of places uh, so that they can have uh, unlimited, like the, the access should be available to the, these drugs are very expensive, particularly the recent drugs that have, uh, because the science is changing, technology is changing, and I, I can see that uh, the drug is getting very expensive for mental illnesses. So these people coming from the uh, mostly come from the you know uh, poor background if they are coming from that side they don't have access they don't have access to the facilities and we need to provide that so we need to focus on these vulnerable groups and we need to focus on their overall you know development rehabilitation they should have a future available how we can make it then you know forward linkages how we can rehabilitate them so that they do not get uh, you know drifted again back into that system so. So it's more about the social and cultural and economically how to create livelihood for these people. If he's coming out of the juvie and he's not getting any, uh, that person is not getting any employment, uh, that person is bound to, you know, go back to the similar environment again and bound to do all those stuff that he ha or she has been doing. So I am, I, it's more about my focus is that whatever policy we are drafting should have this you know, lens, we have to put that lens and see how my policy is going to affect the mental health of that particular individual. Whether I'm, if I'm talking about, you know, you talk about my department, I'm working in urban health, like the urban urban de development. So we see a lot of, you know, these inequalities, the violence, the gender, and why is it happening? Because if water and sanitation is not available in home, it's, it's uh, you know, difficult for a woman to go out and the pe person who's undergoing those kind of issues, of course, will have the stress and those kind of problems. So it's all linked together. You just can't see mental health as a standalone thing. 
every policy has to have that lens onto it when we are drafting. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, now you you also train as a doctor. Uh, you see um, obstetrics and the gynecology at PGI, so you know also you know issues which happen in the medical education system, which by itself can be very stressful. And stressors, I think, have been accentuated in COVID-19, and we know now mental health needs of uh, health providers is also becoming uh, something to worry about. And you know, there have been concerns expressed about that. Uh, because of also the stress of going through the COVID uh, pandemic, having to provide care during that at great risk. So anything uh, which you think would be facing, uh, you know, our health system in terms of taking care of those who are the carers within the health system, which are our providers, and what can we do? Uh, and maybe this could, you know, um, you could also reflect on your own training and, you know, your friends, etc. I'm sure who are practicing now and how you see that. Well, I think uh, this is very important because, you know, we get a doctor after 10 years, like, you know, you, you, they, you groom a doctor in 10 years and then losing a doctor or a healthcare professional, I believe is, a, is one of the biggest loss that a country can have. We are already, as I showed you in my slides, we are already short of doctors and other, uh, you know, healthcare professionals. So, uh, you know, in losing even one of them would be very, very sad. So uh, I'm not saying that other professions are not important, but I'm just saying that this this is something like which is, I mean, I'm a doctor and I really feel close to them and I know how much hard work we have put in to be where we are. So I just believe that, you know, for the he mental health, uh, you know, we really have to have some sort of uh, things into place in every institution. Uh, I have seen doctors working day and night over the past few months and feeling burned out and how we can reduce that stress level, you know, we can we can have uh, because we are short of people so it's very difficult for you know employer also to you know relieve them so in whatever ways if you can give them some short breaks if we can have a call there with their families and friends because you know i have seen that it's it's the talking which relieves a lot of stress you have to have that core uh, you know group of yours where you can feel comfortable that I'm not being judged. I'm not being, you know, looked in any other way and I can speak whatever I want and I can be open to this person and uh, that person is going to be non-judgmental. So that is something I believe is very, very important, not just for a doctor, but anybody else in during these times that if you, you, you are feeling, you know, that there is some kind of thoughts coming to you, you need to break that chain of thought and you need to get up do some exercise, get some time, and you have a walk, maybe you can go to gym, you can listen to music, whatever, you know, calms your mind. And it's very important that as institution, as employers, we should have those kind of systems into places where they can have this kind of access. So recently, as I told you, when one of my employees had committed suicide, so we had a webinar uh, with the, the panelists were from NIMHANS and PGIE and SGPGIE and all those psychiatrists. Uh, so we had, a you know, this kind of a webinar where all the employees could have their uh, you know valuable feedback and learn how we can reduce our stress in these times so they gave some really wonderful ideas that we should stay hydrated we should sleep and we should take enough sleep and uh, you know uh, we should have a, a, this kind of walk or music or whatever you like to do maybe you like to cook food whatever comes your mind so you need to do that find some time for yourself and also talk. You know, that's very important. Don't just keep it to yourself. You need to talk and, you know, release it. And the other person has to understand, be there for them. As an employer, I want, I have always done that, that, you know, keep an open door policy. Anybody who would like to, you know, come to you and want to share their problems, you should give them a, you know, you should listen to them and listening does, doesn't mean that you're trying to fix their problems. You really need to be more understanding and just listen to what they are trying to say and try a, you know, a way out. And I think that's the little, little things, you know, that they really make a lot of difference in anybody's life. Uh, if if they are having issues with their livelihood, if we can you know reach out to somebody, and I'm I've seen very good examples on even social networks like people reaching out and somebody helping them out, and I think this is this is the most human way of like you know helping each other during these tough times. So if you can provide somebody food, if you can provide somebody with a job, and whatever you can do in your capacity, I think this is a time.
time we should come forward and be helpful to each other and not only during these times i mean um, that keeping your mind open and be be a good listener i think that really helps a lot thank you um so one of the questions which has come through is uh, you know a major impediment to accessing mental health um, is basically cost these some of these services especially private sector can be expensive so what is it we can do to address this cost issue and that's true i think of many other specialties as well but especially so you know in with mental health there could be a crisis situation and just because of a lack of affordability you might miss out on an opportunity of uh, being heard and getting care so what can we do to uh, do the better in that uh, domain see we can't be everywhere if we have shortage of doctors i cannot put one psychiatrist in every you know hospital that that's something it's a, it's a limitation that we are facing and we all understand that but you know technology has done a lot of help to us in these days as well it's a kind of blessing that you know the way our whole working has changed in the past few months i i would say for example you know we started using telemedicine recently and through urban development department i'll give you one example that you know we had created integrated command control centers in all the smart cities uh, of uttar pradesh and it's more like you know uh, the smart cities have this concept of the city which is like smart smart in the sense that you have access to all the things and you know uh, it it makes your life easy and quality of life improves so under that we had created integrated command control system so many people you know utilize that infrastructure many districts for example agra varanasi so what they did was they utilized this infrastructure started telemedicine some people started health surveillance for covid during using this infrastructure which was actually not in it was not designed in that uh, you know when we were constructing that we didn't have this thing into our knowledge that covid is going to happen but when it actually happened people utilized it and that's uh, the beauty of human race you know you you survive you know how to survive so they they found out a way and i believe that is something which can be really helpful during these uh, times and with the dearth of resources that we are facing that we really uh, should utilize the technology and we can provide these kind of services and then again this uh, financial thing that i touched about you know increasing access somewhere i believe that you know for the needy and the vulnerable we have to have a system in place where they can be insured and particularly mental health services should be covered under that so that uh, you know um, uh, they can take care of these services for example ayushman bharat i mean that's one of the wonderful programs where you can uh, you know uh, that uh, that uh, scope should, if that can expand and then also you know uh, right now it's based on the socio economic uh, survey that was done in 2011 so we are limited uh, with the number of people that we are providing this insurance but i'm sure that with soon this digital health mission and everything that is coming up if we can expand the scope of services we can expand the coverage of services that is the way forward so uh, so an interesting question on the chat window is that you know we know uh, uh, in medicine uh, there is often a lot of reliance on folk therapies uh, you know the local therapists these might be what you would call in the in quacks but you know they are around and even in the mental health space they provide some element of care now it might not be evidence based care it could also be um, in a worse situation you know uh, care which could cause harm like we saw in the erwadi uh, tragedy in uh, in tamil nadu but is there a role for uh, you know engaging with uh, these local therapists or local providers uh, the informal providers who exist uh, in many of our rural areas i know you are uh, working in uttar pradesh that's also very common that you will have uh, these jhola chap uh, doctors or eks and and they also provide care for mental health it might work it might cause harm that is another issue certainly to look at but is there a way of engaging them in a way that we can uh, get Yes I think this informal sector exists and we we just can't you know we, we need to acknowledge that that this exists and we all know that so whether you 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 know as a doctor and as a service provider i know that you know it it will be better if somebody is in the hands of a doctor uh, with a trained professional but this sector exists and they have a lot of you know kind of uh, i would say impact on the local population so it is up to us i believe that mental health services you know uh if we can if we can see that you know if we can train these people and they can be like a Uh, connection between the uh, uh, the hospitals and the community i mean in that sense i see a scope of utilizing them 
I would not be saying that they should be allowed to prescribe drugs or anything. That should not be because it's not uh, it's not ethical. But at the same time, just you know, utilizing that network, I would say that that can be done. For example, I've seen that one of the examples was. Uh, uh, this when AIDS happened in 1990s, it was an uh, epidemic in like Africa. So in uh, the country like Zambia, they utilize this big network and, you know, they put those things into place, had uh, meetings and everything. And finally, this whole network was utilized and they were, you know, they were, they were counseled in a way that, you know, you, re you don't have to treat them here and you have to send these people to us. So somewhere there was a, there was like um, success in that sense that, you know, uh, earlier they were trying to treat the people because people didn't want to come to the hospitals and these were these kind of people were treating them, which was not good. And it, of course it was going to be very risky. So they, they acknowledged this and they utilized it, their connection, but they counsel them, they train them in the sense that, that how to, you know, refer them, when do they need referral, what are the symptoms and when these kind of symptoms come, you have to refer to these patients to the uh, to the right person. So in that sense, I feel that connection thing we can we can utilize them. Sure, thank you. Uh, so another question is that you know how to ensure that interventions which are directed uh, reduce stigma at the household level and community levels can be delivered, uh, and also linked to primary uh, mental health interventions being implemented. Say as we're talking about the health and wellness centers, we also know stigma is a major issue in COVID-19. That has a relationship with, uh, with obviously mental health care as well. So, what is it that we can do to address the stigma issue? Well, uh, this is uh, very unfortunate. Primary. You know, because of this stigma and fear, I would say this is something that has really uh, led to not we we could not progress much. Only this is one of the biggest reason I would say in our society, particularly, you know labeling them calling them like crazy or mad or something like that if you're like going out and you want to seek a counselor so people are not open i mean even with the best of the best like you know if people are having problems with the most educated strata also i would say that you know you don't want to actually tell people that i'm seeing a psychologist or i'm seeing a psychiatrist you know uh, because in general it's like it's kind of seen very looked down upon that you know you're seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist so i believe it's important that we have to start from the individual uh, the individual has to understand that you know what are their vulnerabilities and i feel this is something that we miss on to when we are in our you know primary and you know middle school level in india particularly we do not talk about it. We we are we never talk about our vulnerabilities. We we feel you know like this is something uh, which will make us look weak. It's more like a cultural thing. Like you know you are raised as a okay. Tum roge. If you are crying, you're a weak person, right? So you you should not cry. And something is like these kind of you know these kind of upbringing and thoughts we inculcate into the minds of our you know near, next generation that this is something uh, which is not acceptable but i think it has to change from there you have to have uh, you know the parents uh, teacher interactions at the school level and then you know uh, the interactions in the community with the community health workers so uh, engaging the community in a very very positive way that it has to be a two-way street you are not only providing information but you have to hear from them so you have to counter their uh, you know problems with the logical explanations those kind of right down to that level we have to you know work and i think it's it's so and it's not going to happen like in one year two years but if we keep doing that i think we keep hammering that that's how social behaviors change and behaviors take time to change and we all understand that as a public health professional it's not easy and the cultural values don't change over time it takes decades and decades but i think that that's how we do it so sure, thank you and maybe linked to that is a question about the fact that we all know that you know especially around with pressure around board exams higher education you know you have all of this spate of uh, Unfortunately, using young children essentially, you know, uh, or adolescents uh, to death by suicide. So, 
is there anything we can do from a syllabus perspective you know do we need to and you were i think hinting at that that we are not taught or we are not made comfortable to talk about our own challenges our you know anxieties our stressors etc so is there a, maybe this is something which needs to be addressed from a curriculum perspective as well or in the way we teach our kids in schools etc yes definitely i mean this is a very very important and critical area that you have rightly touched upon that you know it it cannot just happen that you know at this stage of their exam at the college level you are going to tell them okay relax you know because that person has inculcated and it has been groomed and it's like uh, the parents they have the responsibility not to make them like feel overwhelmed or over pressured with the with the ambitions that they have right we have to understand every child is unique every child has their own uh, you know capabilities uh, we don't have to be in any rat race and we just have to understand that every child should have that kind of environment where they can express uh, their best like where they can be the best of their abilities so uh, not every child has to be a doctor or an engineer which is categorized like okay this is something great you know i mean you just let them be and that has to be coming from the curriculum the children have to be told about like i just a small example you know my son was studying in kindergarten and you know he comes back and tells me one day we were talking and something happened and he says mama you hurt my feelings and i was like okay i was like i never you know it just happens you know you you hear and they, if they are able to express what they are feeling not everything is like you know if you are you are saying you are angry okay why are you angry they should be able to you know this that's what we call emotional intelligence right so that that sort of thing has to be developed and it can develop in anybody at any stage so if we start from that uh, you know school level and we and make them understand and realize what their emotions are i think that's something uh that will really help them become resilient in the long run so that i would suggest that should come into the curriculum like how to manage their emotions how to be you know dealing with that and become uh, more more uh, strong personality and uh, not just intellectually like like just just putting them on that uh, you know um, the the degrees and all that stuff like you know it's it's education is important but at the same time you know life has many practical issues uh, that you have to get through them so they should be trained in that way that you, they should be able to recognize that and they should should be able to handle that so sure. thank you uh, you know uh, as you know the mci was finally dissolved on 24th evening so just literally two days ago the national medical commission is now formally uh, you know the medical education regulator as of yesterday uh, you know part of the reform which is supposed to come is uh, allowing for the creation of mid level uh, cadres like uh, community health officers but we also know that uh, you know there are organizations of doctors which have opposed that and said that you know that's you you, you are coming creating half baked doctors you know and also earlier in your talk you talked about the fact that not everything needs to be provided by a doctor you know a lot of this can be uh, delivered even by non specialist health workers frontline health uh, workers um, and you know so what can we do to maybe because uh, you know those of our colleagues who might be other doctors about the fact that it not everything needs to be delivered by a doctor you know it's important to provide important to provide specialist care at their level but a lot of this is actually you know stuff which can be done through task sharing at, at the local community level and how do we get them on our side in that well i would say even though like number one of course task shifting is important and i will i still believe that you know uh, i am i'm a personally i'm a doctor so i i know that you know uh, not everybody can prescribe the drugs and they are not very much aware unless they are uh, using it and they under they fully they are exposed to their you know what could be the side effects and all so i understand the kind of uh, hesitation or you know the kind of uh, apprehensions the the doctors have but we have to realize at the same point that you know uh, we can we can very easily demarcate the kind of responsibilities that would be given to this kind of cadre that we are going to create it should not be number one overlapping with the clinician and number two i believe it's more about the prevention side so if we can just you know focus them on the prevention and maybe just having or maybe empowering them with technology these days i would say you know maybe in the times to come this primary healthcare can be totally dependent on the technology 
I mean, you might need the specialist, but primary care can, I can see a future where, you know, the primary care can be dependent on uh, technology itself. And you just put your things and your data into it. There are so many sensors coming up. They can read your pulse oximetry. They can do your BP and pulse and everything. And maybe you can do your blood glucose sample, urine sample, and you feed that data. And that data will calculate the automatic algorithms. And they'll tell you, you whether you need to go and see a specialist or you don't. There's, there's so much coming up and I, I just believe, you know, even with everything, we still will be short of doctors. Their position can never be replaced. They are nothing to be scared of or insecure of. Like, you know, after all, this is the only profession where uh, it's human, right? It's asymmetry of information. It The doctor is something I always believe can not be ever replaced like it can be like this machines and technologies can be a, a supportive thing but ultimately you are needed you are very much required and we are so short of you guys that you know i just don't see that you know the, that they anywhere they they are to be threatened or in feeling insecure by anything it's going to just help them so that we can cut down on this burden and lower down this whole thing so that whatever actually has to, those who deserve to see a specialist should go and see a specialist. Right now, what's happening? Now, I was in PGI Chandigarh. The labor room was full of, even a normal delivery was coming to us, a complicated, you know, heart, heart problem with thyroid problem with so many things was also coming to us. So it becomes so difficult because everybody needs different care. Every patient is unique. So if I could manage those people who can be delivered at a lower level, I can provide better care as a specialist to the person who needs me more. So see from that perspective, the load needs to be decreased and the person that is a kind of triage we, are, we need to do and they need to see that, oh, you know, the real, the real needy one who really needs you, you should be able to give them more time, quality time, quality health care with respect and dignity. If we, I'm loading you with 150 patients in three hours, it's very hard. So I don't, I don't think that's a problem. Only thing is roles and uh, the responsibilities have to be very, very clear. So, you know, one of the challenges in mental health in India is the fact that there is a lot of um, missed diagnosis, which is to say that there is a burden out there. We have estimates of that burden, but we might not have sometimes enough data because we have not done enough uh, studies or, you know, we don't have mechanisms even in primary care to do, uh, you know, screening, for example. And uh, unless you do screening, you will never know if someone has a mental disease, unless obviously they have a severe mental disorder and they're reporting uh, for that. But for many common mental disorders, you'll be to pick it up because people don't, might not recognize the symptoms or, uh, or you haven't run a screen for that common mental disorder. So uh, again, you know, what can we do to enhance the level of screening in our facilities, especially in the government sector, say, uh, in a way that uh, even for a patient who walks in with another complaint, you still do a screen for uh, for mental illness because it's likely that they might have mental illness. Uh, so it's more like, you know, you are giving this universal package thing. So I think the health and wellness center approach is pretty much aligned to what you're trying to say here. And, uh, you know, no matter what the patient can come for any other thing, or they can just walk in. So they should, there should be some minimum basic indicators on which they should be, you know, checked upon. So I think this has already been in the guideline that the mental health services have to be insured. Uh, I am not very sure about the implementation side as of now because I'm not there. But uh, if the guidelines are there, I'm sure that already, you know, they have uh, incorporated that aspect that these are the basic indicators which should include non-communicable diseases, which should include your this mental health, hypertension, diabetes, uh, you know, uh, infectious diseases and this uh, uh, reproductive maternal child health. So you have the basic baseline indicators fixed and everybody should have the uh, data on that. So whenever they walk into the that uh, sub-center, they should have it. Okay. Um, so, you know, one, one interesting question is, uh, is the question around the fact that uh, what do we need to do differently in medical training? 
you know, when we train our health professionals so that they are more themselves sensitized about mental health. Because often, you know, we, we have very silos in medical education. You know? If you're an obstiny or if you're a, uh, a physician or if you're a surgeon, you might not, you just refer anyone with any mental health issue to the psychiatrist and you might not pick on issues which might be mental health related in the way symptoms are being expressed, etc. That's one element to it. The other element being more sensitivity towards mental health, uh, whichever speciality you might belong to as a doctor, a nurse, a paramedical uh, worker. So do you think there is a need for more focus on mental health as well in, in health worker training? And how can that be done? Well, uh, there are many researches, Dr. Mohan, that has been done on this aspect. And I was going through one of that. And I think uh, it's very interesting to note that, you know, we have biases, right? We have our own biases. And we don't even know that. And we, we apply that while we are treating patients, while we are seeing our patients. So how a medical student can recognize his or her own bias? There are many uh, nice, you know, researches done on that and how a medical curriculum should, you know, follow that. And I believe it's very important to, uh, you know, put those things into your medical curriculum so that when we are being prepared, we should be understanding if are we, am I, you know, uh, for example, if, if I'm a gynecologist and I'm seeing a patient who has uh, some mental illness, is my behavior different to her To rather uh, if I compare it with any other patient? I don't know. So that's how I, you know, that you really need to see. So those kind of things, particularly, I think me medical students should, should be given those kind of, you know, not only for this, it could be for maybe, you know, the other disparities that we see, gender, we see the caste, we see the, uh, you know, uh, this uh, religion, we see anything. Like what kind of vulnerabilities we can see or the disparities that we see. Uh, the bias, does it exist in me and does it affect the treatment that I'm providing to my patient? Sometimes we are not aware. And I think it's very important to touch upon this into the medical curriculum and we should be made aware so that, although I cannot remove it 100%, but I'm sure if I'm, if I'm aware that something can happen while I'm doing that, um, I mean, uh, that, that can really improvise a lot of care that we provide. Sure, thank you. Uh, you know, one question is around the fact that we know that there's been a, a loss of employment, a fair bit of loss of employment. Um, you know, there have, had, there have been livelihood challenges for many families, uh, both in rural India and urban India. And an element of that is an impact on mental health of both individuals and families. You know, people are stressed out, uh, there, there is uncertainty. We actually, all of us have uncertainty of some extent or the other. We don't know how long this pandemic will go on. Um, and across almost all states, there have been uh, impacts on, on economies and, and also, you know, families and their, and their earnings, etc. So given that, um, I'm sure lawmakers like you, the governments are working on uh, a response to that, that. You know, we recognize that this is a challenge and we need to respond to it. But someone who's focused just on the economy might not recognize that there is a mental health element to the need for the response. So is there something which can be done to integrate a mental health response to many of these uh, responses which are being designed? Because it's clearly going to be uh, probably a requirement to make it more uh, holistic in the way we Yes, I think it's a wonderful thing. And uh, we, we are trying one intervention of such sort that I can give you from my own experience and uh, in my own department. So with the help of UNICEF and UNDP, we have carved out an intervention called Sambhav. It's the synchronized action uh, for the marginalized population and to remove their vulnerab vulnerabilities. So on that, in that, what we have done is basically, uh, as you rightly said, all the departments are trying to do their best, like whether it's health, nutrition, urban development, water sanitation, gender rights, child, well, child rights, um, livelihoods. So industry, everybody's doing in their own uh, you know, capacity. So what we did in this is like we have we are now working on it and it's in the process that we have identified urban slum area in Lucknow and we have identified 30 clusters that will be our test site and on the other side we have the control of 30 slum area population we have collected the baseline data and we will now be doing the intervention of that sort which we will be doing through sambhav centers so what we are doing is we will be picking out the uh, peer group, like the educator, we'll train them from the their own community, people who are like coming forward. And with the help of NGOs, we will be providing these all these programs that are already being provided by the government in a more focused way and also creating awareness about their rights, also create linking them with the, their livelihoods. 
so we are trying to give this holistic approach and we are utilizing people from within the community and we will after you know 6 months to 8 months and 1 year we will see the results and we will compare to and the other intervention the control site we are not uh, uh, putting the extra focus but whatever is going on would be the control so uh, i believe this is something that should give us you know good results that's a hypothesis um but let's see and uh, we are trying our best and i think every department uh, is right now very much sensitized and they are very much uh, you know concerned uh, with the this uh, especially the huge population because up uh, we had lot of uh, you know in migration coming from different uh, states uh, so i can i can vouch for that that you know every department is very much concerned and they are trying uh, to the best of their abilities to provide uh, whatever facilities and can be done for the for the vulnerable and the needy populations and in your experience you know how do you extrapolate that how do you extend that to those who are uh, historically marginalized now, there was one question when we were doing the registrations around the mental health needs of lgbtqia community you know there are other marginalized communities like sex workers etc who are typically you know they they don't they are not able to access health services because often they are not made welcome or they feel stigmatized so um, i'm sure this is something you've also countered as you work in urban bodies that how do you deal with these populations which are hidden from society in a way but we know they are out there and we know that they have health needs and they are vulnerable and we need to respond to them well um you know what this actually came to me as well in my a thought to me that you know what is happening to them and uh, you know on, i'll be honest i i don't know exactly because you know yes i believe that this group is particularly i haven't been able to touch myself and i totally agree with you that you know something because the information is not available number one it's more like you know it's like as you said hidden there's nothing on the papers uh, and we do not have this kind of data available with us where this kind of person is or what is their need so it's kind of a puzzle for me as well like how to actually help these populations so um, very you know very tricky uh if you have any suggestions i'll be open to that if the audience has any suggestions i'll be open to that but it came to me when new zealand you know uh, you must be remembering during covid new zealand had uh, given uh, this um, dbt uh, direct benefit transfer to prostitutes so that was a big news and i just read the news and i wondered what is happening uh, to people in india who are into you know this profession and uh, this uh, something is going on and then how are we going to help them but uh, to be honest i i really don't know because i have no data and i don't know how to reach out sure. um you know there have been many questions uh, a lot of people are curious about the fact that we have such a good act probably the only act where there is a rights based approach especially in the health sector uh, but we are a bit unsure about the implementation part and many states i don't think have been able to follow up on the implementation of the mental health care act so is there something which is a gap in terms of what is known or you know what needs to be in a way that we can implement the act and provide the the rights to those uh, who are disenfranchised right now but who the act empowers through, through its mechanism so what is it that can be done to ensure that more and more states adopt the mechanisms under the act i know many states are working on it but it takes its time and you know i think there is a lot of anxiety among advocates that this is taking way too long what can be done to push that uh, to be faster well i guess again it comes to the advocacy i think the ngos those who are working in this field particularly the all those research people the ngos um it, it's all about you know bringing it to the attention and uh, it's not i mean commitment is there definitely and everybody understands but sometimes for example right now the covid pandemic management has taken the front seat everybody is you know busy with that sort of thing so you know all this thing has taken a back seat for the time being but i'm sure that you know it's there and uh, it's it it has to be just you know it just has to be made uh, to the attention to of the policy maker again that okay this is something which is missing and i've seen some very good examples like you know where you have good advocacy uh, that that really works you know it might take like few months but ultimately if you keep on hammering uh, one thing again and again somewhere you know it just uh, gets uh, its due space 
so uh, it's all about you know bringing it to the forefront maybe all those people i would say the stakeholders has to come forward and they just have to you know uh, bring it to their attention to the right people like the right authority you know and maybe link to that and probably we'll try to wrap up a few minutes then for as i know you have to go to another webinar uh, you know you are clearly a policy maker who's sensitized to the problem you understand that mental health is a major concern and that there is a need to work on this and there are other policy makers who are also sensitized like you but not all policy makers might be sensitized so how can we work with uh, you know a group of sensitized policy makers to in almost like a lobby or process that we can scale up our agenda of of more uh, quality mental health care for the largest number of our fellow citizens what can be done uh, in the policy circles to enhance that any such well i always say you know it it has been always uh, been a, my perspective also uh, like you know earlier i would say that you know you when you're on the other side you see that you think and you believe you come with preconceived notions that the other side may not be you know open or maybe uh, you know they will have their own sort of apprehensions or something like that but uh, to my utter surprise and i feel uh, very happy to share that you know i would say that majority is very much sensitive and open and all you need to do is to uh, you know get the right knowledge broker i would say again the credible person whose words carry weight or the organization the uh, that somebody who's working in this area for quite some long time and have that kind of weightage i would say then you know reaching out to the other side and uh, you know in any case i always feel what is the maximum what we are going to have if even if we lose we don't have anything you know it's it's the same right but if we gain it will be a big leap so that risk is worth taking a shot and going with the right kind of information the policy brief in your hand the right knowledge broker the right influencer to the uh, right authority that's the step forward and I, i can assure you majority is very very sensitive and open to listening to the ideas and even if you get don't get 100% and you get whatever 60 70 80 i always take it as an achievement thank you so jp on the chat window is probably uh, responding to your query that you know how do we respond to the needs of those vulnerable populations like lgbtqia populations we talked about and the point is making is that uh, you know the issues with the, those populations are very complex and almost start from the time that they are born um, and uh, perhaps there is a need for a bouquet or like a variety of sensitive approaches uh, in india to respond to them and maybe that's another conversation we can have in a future webinar specifically but i do want to let you go a few minutes early so that you can have a cup of chai get a break before your next webinar but before that on behalf of sangat and essence i want to thank you a lot for joining us i know uh, you know these times are very busy for all our policy makers but you know you took out the time 90 minutes for us very much appreciated also for spending time in creating that presentation and sharing your insights with us uh, the series of policy makers will continue for all our participants we will uh, keep you uh, in our list of those who are interested in these uh, series of events and we will email out details of the next webinar when it is set up so that if you are interested you can uh, participate uh, thank you all for joining us especially uh, uh, dr kajal for for all of your uh, time with us and for sharing uh, your very very useful in round policy making and the role of evidence in that in the mental health space thank you please take care everyone have a good weekend and thank you for joining bye for now Thank you thank you for having me bye